Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for this virtual U Miami Health Talk, noise-related hearing loss and tinnitus, myths and facts. I'm health journalist Ileana Bravo, and I will be your program moderator for this evening as we're letting hundreds of you participants into the room tonight. I'm gonna to lay out a little bit of the format and some of the uh, ground rules for tonight. But I also would like to share with you that May is Better Hearing and Speech Month. So it's only fitting that tonight's U Miami Health Talk is presented by the U Health Ear Institute. The Ear Institute at the University of Miami Health System is a global center for all hearing loss conditions, evaluations, and treatments. It's also a primary location for continuing medical education and research by the National Institutes of Health. U Health's Department of Otolaryngology ranks number 28 in the nation, according to U.S. News and World Report, and offers world-class care as part of South Florida's only academic health system. U Health's audiology experts are available for patient visits and invite you to schedule an appointment by calling on your screen, as you see, 305-243-3564. And you can schedule an appointment also by visiting umiamihealth.org slash tinnitus. And tonight we have an extra special feature that we would like to unveil. And that is if you have a smartphone or a tablet, you can actually open the camera, hold it over this QR code that you see on your screen. It is active right now and you can be directed to our appointment request form. Take a look at it now. If you have your smartphone, if you have a tablet, you point it directly at it with your camera and it, believe it or not, picks it up. It's advanced technology and you will go right to the appointment request form and be able to secure an appointment uh, and get the process started with one of our experts this evening. So, now, without further ado, let me introduce our program. This evening, University of Miami Health System audiology experts, Dr. Dana Libman and Dr. Tricia Scaglione will discuss noise-related hearing loss and tinnitus. Their presentation will offer an overview of the ear, the hearing process and tinnitus, and will address myths and facts related to these conditions. I will also tell you that you can participate because we are going to have a question and answer session right at the end of the presentations and we'll answer as many of your questions as we can this evening. Some of you have submitted in advance, but don't worry, there's plenty of time to do so uh, now. All you have to do is locate the anonymous Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You see it down there, it has like a little thought bubble and you can feel free to enter your questions as you think of them. We'll prepare them for our speakers to address at the end of the presentation. So now I am pleased to introduce this evening's presenters. You see them on your screen right now. Dr. Dana Libman is a clinical audiologist at the U Health Ear Institute and an assistant professor at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. Dr. Libman's primary interests are diagnostics, hearing aids, hearing conservation, and autotoxicity. She's involved with the American Academy of Audiology and National Hearing Conservation Association and participates in several committees related to autotoxicity. Dr. Libman has also taken the lead on hearing conservation initiatives in the Division of Audiology at the Miller School of Medicine. Dr. Tricia Scaglione is the Director of the Tinnitus and Sound Sensitivities Clinic and Associate Director of Clinical Education and Audiology for the University of Miami Department of Otolaryngology. She has provided clinical education to students at the University of Miami for the past 10 years in the areas of tinnitus and sound sensitivities, auditory and vestibular diagnosis, hearing aids, and auditory evoked potentials. She's board certified in audiology and currently serves as a board member for the Tinnitus Practitioners Association. Dr. Scaglione is involved in numerous committees for the National Academy of Audiology and currently serves on the American Tinnitus Association Scientific Advisory Committee. Please help me welcome Dr. Libman and Dr. Scaglione. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this session tonight. My name is Dana Libman and with my colleague, Dr. Tricia Scaglione will be talking to you about noise-related hearing loss and tinnitus and addressing some myths and facts about this area. So May is Better Hearing and Speech Month. So what better month to have this talk? 
This month is dedicated to raising awareness about communication disorders involving hearing, speech, and language. It's also a great time to introduce treatment options to people who may already have hearing loss or tinnitus and to inform you about things that you can do to protect your own hearing. Here are some facts and figures for you. Approximately 15% of American adults aged 18 and over report some trouble hearing. There's over 45 million Americans who report having tinnitus as of 2018. And among teenagers and young adults aged 12 to 35 years in middle and high income countries, nearly 50% are exposed to unsafe levels of sound from personal audio devices like iPods, or stereos, and around 40% are exposed to potentially damaging sound levels at clubs, discos, or bars. But it's, there's good news. Hearing loss and tinnitus related to noise exposure can be prevented. So now we're gonna go back to the basics and see how our hearing system works. First, did you know that sound is actually a pressure wave that is the result of vibrating air molecules? A decibel is how we measure sound, and it measures the pressure or forcefulness of that sound. The energy of the sound wave or intensity doubles with every three decibel increase. How do we hear? Well, sound first enters the external auditory canal and moves the eardrum, which in turn moves the tiny three little bones in the middle ear. The tiniest bone is called the stapes and it's connected to the inner ear organ called the cochlea. When the sound goes into the cochlea, sensitive cells in the cochlea called hair cells send a wave of energy to the hearing nerve and then to the brain. So I mentioned hair cells in the cochlea, the organ of hearing, but what exactly are hair cells? Well, these are sensitive cells in the inner ear that transform sound into an electrical signal and that electrical signal is transmitted from the hearing nerve to the brain. Damaged hair cells can lead to hearing loss or to tinnitus. Once your hair cells have been damaged, it is permanent. Now, if we look at these pictures here on the right, on the top, we see a healthy inner ear with healthy rows of outer and inner hair cells present in all locations. On the bottom picture, we see that many of these cells are absent or damaged. You can think of hair cells as you would a patch of grass. You can walk over the grass and the grass bends, but then it typically comes back up straight. But if you walk over the grass over and over again, or if you drive over it with a car or a truck, not all of the grass will come back up straight. Some of the grass will, will be broken and damaged for good. So now let's look at some common sounds and their loudness levels. Here you'll see on the screen sort of a thermometer of sound, where zero here represents the softest sound you can hear in decibels. And up at 165 decibels, there's a 12 gauge shotgun. You can think of a whisper being at around 25 decibels. Busy city traffic, which many of us have experienced here in Miami, between about 80 and 85 decibels. And that rocket launch, well, that's, that's off the charts. Sounds of less than 75 decibels, even after long exposure, are unlikely to cause hearing loss and average conversational speech is right around 60 decibels. So how do we know exactly what levels are safe to listen to? Well, there are two organizations, NIOSH and OSHA, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health and the Occupational Safety and Health Administration that provide regulations for occupational health and safety. According to each of these organizations, a person can be safely exposed to each decibel level for its corresponding time on the graphs here without risk of noise-induced hearing loss. OSHA tends to be a bit more liberal, and they say that it's safe to be in 90 decibels for eight hours, and every five decibels above that, you have to half the amount, the amount of time exposure. Whereas NIOSH is a little bit more conservative, and they recommend no more than 85 decibels for eight hours, and every three additional decibels, you have to half the amount of time exposure. Some examples of sounds that you hear in daily life that may have a risk of noise-induced hearing loss may be concerts, power tools, and motorcycles. Now, there are some exposure, overexposure warning signs that you may experience after being around loud sound. For example, ear pain, ringing, buzzing, humming, other type of noises in the ears. 
a muffled sound or a, a feeling of fullness in your ears, difficulty hearing and noise, or even a temporary decrease in your hearing, which is known as a temporary threshold shift. But if we think back to that grass analogy, you can have a temporary reduction in hearing, but prolonged exposure and repeated exposure can lead to permanent hearing loss. And this graphic here on the right is from the World Health Organization, and it's sort of a speedometer of common sounds. And you see average conversational speech at around 60 decibels. It's safe pretty much to be in that level of sound for an unlimited period of time. But some sounds we may encounter on a daily basis or on a weekly basis, such as a lawnmower, a hair dryer, these sound are starting to be sounds where you may have to take more care to how much time you're exposed to them. So now we're going to look at some myths and facts about the dangers of noise exposure. The first myth is that noise-induced hearing not is not that noise-induced hearing loss is not preventable. In fact, in most situations, it's very preventable. And there are specialized types of hearing protection for most occupational and recreational needs. Here you'll see many different types of hearing protection devices. These are used to reduce the level of sound coming into the ear. There's many ready fit, one size fit most earplugs, such as these foam plugs or these plastic plugs. They reduce sound, generally preserve sound quality and they're low cost. There's over the ear muffs. These are routinely used in very loud environments such as people working around jet engines, airline mechanics, uh, people shooting guns, for example. And there are even custom and non-custom earplugs for music and musicians that look like this for the non-custom. Or custom just means that a mold is taken of your ear and they're built to fit in your ear. These are good for music because they're designed to more closely imitate natural hearing. And where some of these ready fit, one size fit most plugs are great for reducing unwanted noise from machines, for example, Music, you really wanna be able to hear clearly. And there's even electronic plugs that open and close the, the noise reduction depending on an impulse sound. So for example, shooting a gun. The next myth is that music is not noise and therefore cannot cause hearing loss. Well, exposure to sound, whether it's noise, music or otherwise can be harmful depending upon two main factors, intensity or level or volume and duration, the amount of time exposed. Some rule of thumb about music is that prolonged exposure to sound above 85 decibels could cause damage to the ears. Rock car concerts have been shown to have more risk than classical music. Now, anyone can enjoy music at safe levels by simply reducing the volume or exposure time. You can either physically reduce the volume using earplugs, in-ear monitors are a specialized type of device for musicians or people in the music industry, or you could actually measure levels and calculate the safe exposure time yourself. Now, most people won't be carrying around one of these, a sound level meter. But you may not know, with technology now and with the advancements in apps, you can download a sound level meter app into your smartphone, whether it's an Android or an iPhone. The next myth is that noise induced hearing loss is immediate and permanent. Well, the fact is, this depends on the type of sound loudness level and duration of exposure. There are some sounds that can cause immediate damage, such as a firecracker going off near the ear, an explosion, or a gunshot without use of proper ear protection. But most types of noise-induced hearing loss is gradual, it takes time, and you may not even notice it until it's too late to do anything about it other than um, hearing aids or something along those lines. And the next myth is that if a person works in a noisy job, there is nothing that he or she can do about it. Well, many occupations actually are required to have worker safety precautions, including earplugs or other personal protective equipment, such as goggles or masks. If you feel that you may be in an, a work environment where there's too much noise, you can ask your supervisor if there are any personal protective equipment available for you, such as earplugs. And if not, you can get earplugs fairly inexpensively and the drugstore or amazon.com. And now I'd like to uh, transition the next part of the talk to my colleague, Dr. Tricia Scaglione. Thank you, Dr. Libman. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. As, as Ileana um, 
inform everybody, Dr. Lemon and I are here from the Ear Institute, and I'm the director of our tinnitus program, and want to share a little bit about the noises that you or a loved one may be hearing in your head or your ears. But first, let's settle a common debate. How do you pronounce this word? Is it tinnitus or tinnitus? Well, the answer is actually both. Both are accepted terms, though most healthcare providers or more healthcare providers tend to say tinnitus. However, if you say tinnitus, don't worry, you're correct as well. So what is tinnitus? Tinnitus is the perception of a sound that you may hear in either your head or your ears, whether that be one ear or both ears. And it's a sound that's not actually happening in the environment around you. It's a sound that's being perceived from within your body. And in the majority of cases, only the individual experiencing tinnitus will be able to hear the noise. So unfortunately, if you are experiencing tinnitus and you ask your loved one or healthcare provider to come listen close to you, they probably and usually aren't able to hear the noise. Now tinnitus can present as many different kinds of sounds. Most commonly patients report that their tinnitus sounds like a ringing or buzzing. Sometimes I have patients tell me that the tinnitus sounds like a hum, like from a like fluorescent lights. Um, I have had a laugh with a couple of patients when they've come in and said, you know, I started hearing this chirping sound and I thought I had a cricket in my house, but after a lot of seeking, you know, what could be causing that sound, it turns out there wasn't a pesky cricket, that the sound was actually coming from my ears. And the sound can also sound like whooshing or pulsing. Sometimes it even sounds like music. So Dr. Lipman did a great job of, of telling us about the anatomy of the ear and how sound travels through the ear. So let's look uh, at another processing center and how it applies to tinnitus. So sound enters the ear and it goes through the three parts of, of the ear from the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. The inner ear being the organ of hearing or the cochlea. And as Dr. Libman shared, there are cells that line that cochlea called hair cells. Well, once the information stimulates those hair cells, the information then travels through the hearing nerve, which is called the eighth nerve or the auditory nerve, up to processing centers in the brain called the auditory cortex. Now, why this is important is because you may feel like you're hearing the tinnitus in your ears, but it's actually being perceived in your brain. But tinnitus is just a sound. We hear sounds all the time. So why are some people bothered by their sound? And the answer for that is because of another processing system in the brain called the limbic system. Now the limbic system is quite amazing and it controls a number of functions for the body. But for the purpose of this talk, let's focus on the amygdala, which regulates emotion. So, the reason why you are bothered by your tinnitus, if you are bothered, is specifically because of the limbic system within your brain. So what's happening? Why is it being bothered and, and how is it playing a role? Well, there are a number of different theories on tinnitus. And one of the most commonly accepted models is that of the neurophysiology, neurophysiology model by Dr. Pavel Jasterboff. And what Dr. Jasterboff has theorized is that a sound is presented and it travels through our hearing system. Uh, it then starts to be processed in our subconscious and eventually makes its way up to our higher level cortical areas, in this case, our auditory cortex, where the brain then starts to evaluate that sound that's coming in. Is it a new sound? Is it an old sound? And from there, the information is passed on to that limbic system that I was just talking about. The limbic system is responsible for putting a label on all of the sounds that we hear. It does it every day, not just with tinnitus. And so it labels sounds coming in as positive sounds, negative sounds, or neutral sounds. Once it's created this label, it then tells other systems within the brain, specifically the autonomic nervous system or ANS, how to have your body react to it. So, if you heard the theme music for Jaws, your brain would hear the sound, the limbic system would identify it as a threatening sound, a scary sound, and it would tell your ANS to, re to react reflexively to it in a sense that you're defensive or you're stressed or you're scared. So maybe your eyes, your pupils start to dilate or you start to feel like you're more on edge. That's because of the limbic system. 
But if we listen to something pleasant, like a song that we like and we're very fond of, the limbic system labels it a positive sound, and then it tells our body to react in a favorable way. So maybe you feel very lighthearted and you feel like you're kind of moving around or dancing with the music. So the same goes with tinnitus. When this sound starts to present for whatever is the cause for yourself, the brain starts to identify it of, you know what, this is a sound that wasn't there before. And the limbic system, in some cases, labels it as a negative sound. And in return, your body goes into this defense mode, and this can cause stress and anxiety and can have a negative impact on your quality of life. But in good news, when we manage tinnitus, we can actually retrain the limbic system to relabel how it interprets the tinnitus and instead make it a neutral sound, like when we listen to a fan. So in tinnitus management, what we really want to do is we want to promote something that's called habituation. And in its simplest sense, habituation just means getting used to something. We habituate all of the time. And an example of this is I want you to think about right now, are you wearing a watch or a pair of glasses, maybe a shirt or pants? And without touching that item, without looking at it, I want you to bring your mind, your attention to it and think about how does it feel? Is it heavy? Is it loose? Is it comfortable? And I bet you can answer these questions. And I also bet that just a couple seconds ago, you weren't thinking about your watch or your glasses, but those items were there. You didn't just put them on. So why is it that our brain can just forget it? Well, it's because it's a beautiful thing and it can habituate. And so we can habituate to our tinnitus as well. We can train our brain not to focus on it. So let's talk about a couple of myths and facts. First of all, there's a myth that tinnitus is not common. Actually, this is completely incorrect as many, many individuals experience tinnitus. In fact, as Dr. Libman said earlier, about 45 million Americans experience tinnitus such as some degree, and it's our number one service-related disability. And tinnitus doesn't discriminate. It's not just for adults. Pediatric, uh, pediatric patients can also experience tinnitus as well. Another myth is that hearing loss is always the cause for tinnitus. When in reality, hearing loss is often associated with tinnitus because tinnitus is commonly a symptom of hearing loss, However, that's not always the case. You can have tinnitus and normal hearing. You can have hearing loss and no tinnitus, or you can have both. And in fact, many different health conditions can contribute to the onset of tinnitus or the exacerbation or fluctuations in tinnitus, as well as some of our habits that you might already be engaging in. So let's talk about a couple of those conditions or health habits. Some, some common uh, triggers for the onset of tinnitus can be hearing loss and noise exposure, like we've already talked to you about in this presentation, but also head injuries, medications, the general aging process, and disease. Now, this list is certainly not extensive, but it's a, a general overview that hearing loss is not the only thing that can contribute to the tinnitus. And many times patients are surprised to find out that many things that we ingest on a routine basis like caffeine or alcohol can can exacerbate or worsen or, or temporary worsen or cause some fluctuations in the tinnitus so if you feel like your tinnitus you have good days and bad days or it might spike it may be because of high sodium maybe you had had sushi and it made it spike or um maybe you had a, you know a, a glass of wine and it contributed to it but also stress Stress to tinnitus is like fuel to a fire. Stress can increase tinnitus, and in turn, tinnitus can increase stress, and it can become this really nasty, vicious cycle that we need to break. Oh, a myth that I absolutely hate is that there's nothing you can do for tinnitus. I wish I could see you and have you all raise your hand if you ever went to a healthcare provider and had somebody say, sorry, there's nothing you can do with it. You just have to live with your tinnitus. Just learn to ignore it. When in reality, there are many things we can do to manage our tinnitus. How your tinnitus is right now, if you have it, doesn't have to be how it is forever. We can improve your awareness to the tinnitus. And tinnitus management doesn't always involve uh, lengthy treatments or expensive gadgets. 
Sometimes it just takes putting some sounds in your everyday environments. Something as simple as a fish tank or a fan can provide a lot of relief for a tinnitus patient. Um, I would say about 90% of my tinnitus patients have trouble sleeping at night because of their tinnitus. Many of these patients find relief by using a special pillow with speakers in it that they can use soothing music um, in the bedroom. Managing stress and promoting relaxation, whether it be exercise, yoga, mindfulness, this is really great when you're trying to manage tinnitus. And if you need something that's more portable throughout the day, then we can consider something like hearing aids, or if you don't have hearing loss, an ear level tinnitus sound generator. Now, again, this is not an exhaustive list, but a general overview of some examples of what might work for you. So if you're wondering about what you can do for your tinnitus, first, remind yourself that your tinnitus can be managed. Um, then you're more than welcome. I invite you to join us at our UM Tinnitus Clinic. Patients that are interested in tinnitus services are enrolled in a one and a half hour tinnitus education session. Tonight, we're only given a brief amount of time to introduce you to tinnitus, uh, but in this session, we dedicate an hour and a half to really trying to delve into what is tinnitus and what can we do about it. And then we would like for you to, we recommend that you undergo an ENT consultation and a hearing test with an audiologist. If you've already received these services in an outside facility, that's not a problem. We're happy to, you know, just make sure that your tinnitus specialist has, has a copy of those records. And then depending on your unique needs, you'll be, your tinnitus specialist, such as myself, will discuss with you about what device or management option is right for you and help get that ordered and get you on that tinnitus plan. And then in, many, in some cases, individuals require an interdisciplinary management team, meaning it may be an audiologist, an ENT, a mental health provider, maybe even a dentist, believe it or not. So with that said, I thank you for listening to this general overview of tinnitus and Dr. Libman and I welcome any questions that you may have related to noise related hearing loss or tinnitus. Thank you very much, Dr. Libman and Dr. Scaglione. Very informative and eye-opening. And thank you for clarifying for the general public that it's tinnitus or tinnitus, because I think most people have always pronounced it uh, the prior way. So well, we're ready to begin the Q&A portion now. And so many of you have successfully found the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So uh, those of you who haven't already, go ahead and start entering them. And we are going to move this along as fast as we can to get as many questions in. So let's begin with the first question for Dr. Scaglione. Is there a correlation between tinnitus and your vision? Hmm, great question. So while it's not as common, there is a correlation in, in some individuals. There is a visual condition called visual, uh, visual snow syndrome. And in some patients that experience VSS, they report tinnitus as well. Also, some patients experience vestibular or balance um, issues. And in those cases, those patients may also experience visual tinnitus as well. So, Yes, in some conditions, there is a correlation. And here's another one for you, Dr. Scaglione. What advancements have been made to help people with tinnitus? So right now, the latest advancements that's being worked on um, is looking at um, a type of treatment that's called bimodal stimulation. And what we're trying to do, or what researchers are trying to do, is to, to treat the tinnitus right at the auditory cortex in the brain. And by doing so, they are, they are looking at delivering a sound stimulus through the ears, like a headset, as well as another device that you would put on either um, your tongue or your face, depending on there's different devices out there that can help to promote what's called neuromodulation and help to facilitate some changes in the brain to help reduce the tinnitus. And the preliminary studies from a couple of different manufacturers right now are really showing very promising, uh, promising results. That's great to hear. All right, Dr. Lindman, you're up now. Is it dangerous to constantly be using earphones or earbuds? And we're all guilty of it. <laughs> it's not dangerous if you're listening at a safe level. And if you're concerned about what the level may be, 
Well, one rule of thumb is if that if somebody else can hear the music coming out of the earbuds, it's probably too loud. Some phones, for example, in iPhones, there's even a way that you can look under your settings and your haptics to see your general listening habits. You could contact your specific uh, Android phone provider if to find out if you have that available in your Android phone. That's great. We'll all be checking that tonight. <laughs> um, our next question is, is still for you. I've lost hearing in my left ear and can't hear anything out there. I'm worried that in the future I will lose hearing in my right ear as well. Yes, that, that is very, must be very frightening to have had a sudden hearing loss. Um, there's unfortunately not a lot of way that we can predict for sure if you'll lose hearing in the other ear. The most important thing is to have regular hearing checkups. Um, and if you haven't already, make sure you have a consultation with an ear specialist, an ENT. All right, this is the question that I think is on, on the minds of so many of our participants tonight who suffer from tinnitus, and that is Dr. Scaglione, is there a cure for tinnitus? Ah, the big question, question I get asked almost on the daily. So the answer is no, there's not a cure, but there are, there's research going on around the world to investigate a cure, try to find the cure, but this also shouldn't be something that's disheartening for those of you who are attending. Tinnitus can be managed. Tinnitus can be improved. And I have had many patients that feel like they don't notice their tinnitus anymore. Everyone's results obviously will vary. There's many different considerations there. But I want you to think about um, there are other health conditions out there like hypertension. There's not a cure for hypertension, but it can be managed and you can have quality of life through proper diet and medication and, and monitoring there. So in other words, treating it like a chronic health condition that you live with and you make better using whatever tools are, are out there. Yes, and most importantly, knowing that even if you're living with it, think back to what I showed you with your shirt and your watch, that it might be there, but you're not necessarily paying attention to it, that we can, we can improve it for you. We can improve your brain, have the way that your brain focuses on it. Uh, Dr. Libman, uh, I think you, you mentioned earlier about uh, shooting pistols and rifles and all that. What's the proper hearing protection um, in, in a shooting range, for instance, for people to protect their they're hearing. Well, that's a great question. And in many, in many gun ranges, particularly indoors, it's a requirement. They won't let you in without, without proper ear protection. Um, but generally, it's going to be an over-the-ear type fitting device. And many people will even wear earplugs under the, the um, muffs because gunshots are one of the most potentially damaging levels of sound. There are even specialized ear muffs for hunters, for example, that they're electronic and they turn on and off when, when the loud sound comes in. Great. Um, Dr. Libman, what are the major sources of noise that impact our health? And as a follow-up to that, what can be done socially and even politically to bring awareness and help control or eliminate noise that impacts our health in society? I think if we're thinking about the general society, we, even if you don't work in a noisy job or you're not a musician or potentially exposed to loud levels of sound on a daily basis, you know, more, more often than not, you'll be exposed to traffic noise, um, go to concerts, using power tools once in a while. Um, and sometimes there's noise around you that you can't control, people living very close to the airport, for example. Well. Sometimes there are things that can be done. The World Health Organization sees this as a public health issue, and there have been a lot of, uh, of movements around the world to, to work on this. For example, in 2009, the European Commission mandated that output levels in new personal audio devices should be set to a standard of 85 decibels, and that they could allow users to increase them to a level, a maximum of 100. But when the users raise them to that maximum, a message will pop up indicating the possible risk of damage. And in, here closer to home in the US, in 2014, the Minneapolis City Council passed an ordinance making it compulsory for bars and clubs offer free earplugs to its patrons. 
So this kind of a directive could have far reaching outfit um, effects and it's a great idea for other states to adopt as well. Um, Dr. Scaglione, here's, here's, um, here's one. I've heard this before. And so this question I think is quite relevant. Is it true that tinnitus can be caused by issues with the jaw muscles or bite uh, as temporomandibular joint disorder? Yes, actually it can be. So uh, sometimes patients are surprised to hear that when I when they kind of meet with me and I'm talking about, okay, well, how about your teeth? Any dental issues, any jaw issues? They you know, wonder, you know, are you just being nosy? Why are you asking these questions? But the reality is that yes, there can be a component that if you are having an issue with your jaw, an issue with your teeth, actually an issue with your neck and your cervical region, this can contribute to your tinnitus as well. It kind of makes sense because, you know, grinding of the teeth and so mm -hmm. forth would be affecting this whole region. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I think you referred to, one of you referred to alcohol, uh, perhaps affecting uh, tinnitus. Um, is it in fact alcohol or any certain uh, medications that exacerbate tinnitus? And in turn, are there vitamins or supplements can, that can help? So that, that's definitely a multi-part question. So let me, let me I'll, I'll break it down. So medications, there's a number of medications um, available for patients that may have tinnitus listed as a side effect. Now, if you are wondering if, the tinnit, if any of the medications that you're on has tinnitus as, listed as a side effect, I usually recommend asking your pharmacist. They can quickly look it up in, um, in, in their systems to see if it's listed. Now, just because it has tinnitus listed as a side effect does not mean that that's necessarily contributing to your tinnitus. So if you've been on a medication for five years, but your tinnitus started you know, a couple months ago, it's probably not related to that medication unless you know, potentially if you had a, a change in, in your dosage or you know, some kind of change there. So if you, if you do have questions about your specific medication, check with your pharmacist and then follow up with your referring physician. Never just discontinue uh, a medication or alter, never alter without talking with your referring physician. Now, um, there are some supplements on the market that some individuals and some healthcare providers will recommend that patients may want to try some uh, antioxidants. Um, in, in general, I, I personally haven't seen tremendous improvement through them, uh, through the use of these supplements. That said, in the patients that had had improvement through using antioxidant supplements, it's typically patients that have started using them very close to the time of onset for tinnitus. So if you had tinnitus in the past couple of weeks that has just started, those supplements may be helping you because the supplements or antioxidants can help repair potential damage in the ear. Um, and if, but if you've had your tinnitus for five years, you may not be as successful with something like a supplement. But again, if you're interested in, in looking at supplements or vitamins, definitely talk with your managing healthcare provider. Lastly, you had asked about alcohol. So alcohol, the, the acronym is CATS, like the, like the acronym, um, like the animal, caffeine, alcohol, tobacco, and sodium. Those are the, the common ones. And it doesn't mean because if you drink alcohol that it's definitely going to worsen your tinnitus and it doesn't mean that it's definitely going to cause tinnitus. However, it's, it's been shown that it's not uncommon that these particular uh, substances can contribute to a temporary increase in the tinnitus. So uh, I caution patients that if they have bothersome tinnitus, to if they find a correlation between these substances to try to reduce the intake um, or, or eliminate if possible. But if you enjoy a glass of wine at dinner and it doesn't, and you know, if you don't have tinnitus or it doesn't increase your tinnitus, then moderation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you refer to a, some health conditions that cr have caused tinnitus, but um, some of the others that people are asking tonight are hay fever, such as allergies. Mm -hmm. How about tumors? Or how about your general gut health, your digestive system? Any of those? Absolutely. So hay fever and allergies, yes, it could have a link to, to um, tinnitus. Um, the, the gut issues, 
I tend to hear less issues, I would say, with, with gut. I'm um, not saying it can't happen, but I would say that that's lower on the radar. Um, there was another health condition you had asked about, hay fever. Um, tumors. Tumors, yes. So sometimes tumors, um, specifically in the ear or in the brain, uh, depending on where that tumor is located, sometimes can be contributing to the tinnitus as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Lemon, uh, jump in here also, if you would, on hearing aids. So it, it would seem that hearing aids would help with tinnitus or obviously with your hearing loss, but can it actually have an opposite effect? Well, it's very individual, uh, but oftentimes hearing aids um, do help with tinnitus in a patient that also has hearing loss because you're, you're hearing other sounds in the environment and that sort of helps to mask out the tinnitus. A lot of people with tinnitus will report that, you know, during the day when they're busy and they're active, they may not notice it as much as when they, you know, they want to wind down and relax at the end of the day or go to sleep. So yes, they, they can be very helpful. There are some rare cases where someone finds that the, the hearing aid exacerbates their tinnitus, but I haven't seen that as often. And I wonder if the more advanced high-tech uh, hearing aids, uh, you know, at the high end of the market that even are Bluetooth enabled and all that, are, are some better than others because of that? And of course, cost is a factor here. Um, I, I, I would say that in terms of how much you hear and in terms of the tinnitus, there's probably not that much of a difference, especially in terms of Bluetooth. But in some cases, some more advanced technology is more effective at reducing background noise. Um, so besides standard treatment options for tinnitus, now we're going into a whole realm of alternative treatments. How about CBD oil, steroids, stem cell therapy? Any of this on the forefront? I mean, those are certainly being explored right now. They're, I wouldn't say it's being commonly recommended for management, but that would also come from the ENT physician who would recommend that. Dr. Lemon and I are audiologists, so we would not be the referring provider for CBD, for, um, for steroids, any of these treatments. So if anyone is interested in having these discussions, certainly ask your, your ENT physician um, about these options and they can help to clarify for you if you would be a candidate um, and their thoughts. And Dr. Scaglione, you referred to um, high salt foods. So you, you use the example of sushi and mm -hmm. so forth, maybe making it worse. What other parts of your diet could make it worse or exacerbate? Sure. And when I said sushi, just to help clarify, I meant um, soy sauce with sushi that sometimes patients don't realize the high sodium that in that soy. Um, in general, a healthy diet is very, very important because what you put in is what you get out. And so if you're putting in a lot of sugars, um, um, a lot of carbohydrates that could also be uh, potentially impacting your, your health and your awareness and health, your wellness and your tinnitus as well. Um, certain health conditions do require uh, a specific diet. So you know, if you, if you were to come in and I, I'd be happy to talk about individual needs um, and you're, of course, your, your family healthcare physician and your ENT can also talk about uh, individual needs for diet. But in general, you know, you want to try to stay away from too much sugar or over carb loading. Yeah. So, so like, let's get back to basics. A healthy diet is always a good thing for any health condition. Yes. Dr. Lindman, let's talk about why tinnitus uh, with hearing loss is so quickly associated with Meniere's disease. Well, Meniere's disease is one condition that is actually the top four symptoms are hearing loss, tinnitus, ear pressure, fullness, uh, fluctuating, well, pressure, fullness in the ear, and um, vertigo. But Meniere's disease, so that's basically just one specific symptom of Meniere's disease. Um, but there's many conditions, other conditions that also have tinnitus as a symptom. Okay. How about type 1 diabetes and with the use of insulin? Any correlation there? 
Um, so type 1 diabetes, uh, diabetes in general may have hearing loss and tinnitus as a, uh, a, the individual with diabetes may experience hearing loss and or tinnitus. Uh, not necessarily a correlation with the insulin though. Mm -hmm. um, here, here's a very specific and interesting question. Can neuromodulation be used for someone who has a cochlear implant? Yes, they could, but it just... It would depend on the delivery model that would deliver that neuromodulated stimulus. So, um, yeah, it, I mean, it, it, right now, I don't know of a device in particular that's on the market that's available that offers neuromodulation for a cochlear implant user. However, I don't think that that's something that um, is completely off the table. Because neuromodulation essentially means that we're, you know, we're, we're changing, uh, we're working with the brain's plasticity. So as, as long as you have a brain, you just have to be able to get the <laughs> stimulus there. Um, and that's where some of those manufacturers, those researchers are looking at not just the auditory stimulus, but also that tactile using the tongue or a stimulation on the face or the neck. Mm -hmm. um, and, and now there's the spectrum of how frequent your tinnitus is versus not. So if it only happens occasionally, what's the best course of action to take right away or immediately, or maybe none? Well, I guess I would want you to ask yourself, is it bothersome? If it's there, but it's not bothersome, don't, don't, you don't have to do anything. And um, if it is bothersome, but it's just momentary, most of us from time to time in our life will experience some temporary tinnitus, whether it be after a loud event, um, you know, like a concert or a sporting event, we might have a little bit of ringing in our ears that will dissipate, that usually dissipates in time. Um, but if it's bothersome, try putting on some background noise, whether it's ambient noise, like a, a, a TV or a radio, even something like a fan can be very helpful in distractions. If you start noticing your tinnitus, try to get engaged in something else, whether that be washing the dishes or jumping on the phone and having a telephone call with somebody. Just take yourself away from that quiet space of where you're maybe just focusing on your tinnitus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and a question about who, what professional to see. So you, you are both audiologists. This uh, person asks, when should I seek out a neurologist versus an audiologist versus an ENT specialist? That's an excellent question. I mean, I think the first step oftentimes is a hearing test. And um, if there's an asymmetry in the hearing, certainly we would recommend a follow-up with the ENT if they don't have one. And I think a, neuro a neurology consult would be something that the ENT would decide, or perhaps if the patient's having other symptoms like headaches or, or dizziness, they may pursue an appointment with a neurologist. I also mentioned that some ENTs are, are what is called an otoneurologist. So they're uh, a specialized ENT um, we're specialized in with neurology as well. How careful should people be with uh, dental work, such as a root canal? Could that make the tinnitus worse? And and if the person already has tinnitus, say to the endodontist, uh, you know, be aware. Would not tell somebody to defer necessary health care for fear that they may have a change in their tinnitus, because there's also a chance, a significant chance that it might not do anything for the tinnitus. And if you don't get that root canal and then it becomes an infection, that infection, maybe that turns into tinnitus. So there's so many factors that there. I think that if you have a concern about having dental work, just have that conversation with your oral specialist. Um, and, um, it, and it is possible that maybe from the drilling and the dental tools, you might have a slight increase in your tinnitus after your procedure, but in most cases it comes back down to baseline. Um, we're, we're getting close, but still a few questions left and uh, let, let's uh, continue to tee them up for you because you're both doing such a great job of quickly running through them. Is there a relationship between vertigo and tinnitus? I'm also a balance specialist, so <laughs> balance meaning with vertigo. So um, the, the, uh, there can be a correlation. So tinnitus is a symptom and vertigo is a symptom. So they may, there might be a correlation if there's an underlying condition that is causing both the symptoms of the dizziness and the tinnitus. That said, they might be unrelated as well. So it's really important to 
when, when you're meeting with your healthcare provider, if you're meeting with your audiologist, if you're meeting with your ENT, to really be clear about when your symptoms started. If they started around the same time, that it is quite possible that same condition caused both issues. But um, if they were spread apart, they may be unrelated. Okay. If a person is diagnosed with eustachian tube dysfunction, can this trigger tinnitus? So yes, um, eustachian tube dysfunction, uh, meaning that the, the, the little pressure system in the middle ear that regulates um, our airflow, and most commonly we think about this when, we're, when we dive deep in a pool and we feel the pressure, we want to pop our ears, we go on a plane, that's our eustachian tube. If that's not functioning correctly, in some cases, some individuals may have tinnitus from that. Um, in those cases, if the eustachian tube dysfunction is managed, then it is quite possible that the tinnitus, that individual may find that there is a resolution in their tinnitus, which ties back to the earlier question about hay fever and allergies. When you have hay fever and allergies, you may have eustachian tube dysfunction because of, uh, as a result, and in turn, be perceiving tinnitus. Dr. Libman, can a stroke cause tinnitus? Well, a stroke does affect blood flow to the brain. Um, there, there are many things that can cause tinnitus. And that, that would, I have seen patients that have had strokes that have tinnitus as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and now that we, uh, the general public is getting back to traveling on airplanes, uh, how can we best manage our tinnitus uh, when flying? Unless you have a, a specific condition that your ENT has told you uh, to be careful with flying in general, then, you know, enjoy your trips. We've all been cooped up in the house for a year. Um, enjoy your travels. Just listen to your, your as Dr. Libman was saying, just if you listen to headphones on the plane, try to listen at a safe level. Um, I it, it think it'd be more of blasting music on the plane for if you're lucky enough to take a very long flight somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we want to make sure you're giving your ears some, some rest. And there are some fantastic noise canceling headphones out there that will allow you to listen at a safer level. Yes, indeed. My husband's one of those on airplanes. <laughs> um, by the way, uh, did either of you find any issues during this COVID year that uh, affected hearing loss, tinnitus, or any of the, you know, hearing conditions? Just curious. Yeah, so we have seen some patients that have come into the clinic that have experienced um, hearing loss or tinnitus either after contracting the coronavirus or after uh, receiving one or both of their vaccines, regardless of uh, manufacturer. Um, but that said, you know, tinnitus is not a recognized side effect of the vaccine or the virus. So it shouldn't be a deterrent for, from somebody getting the vaccine if that's something that they um, are, are planning on doing. Yes. Um, I think this has been incredibly informative and has opened so many windows for people who perhaps were you know, in, in the dark about these. So I, I would love to get a wrap up message from um, both of you as to the importance of people being in tune with their hearing uh, issues and, and how to really do something about it, how to be proactive about it. Uh, you're up first, Dr. Scaglione. So my message for, for everyone is just, again, have hope and know that there are options to manage your tinnitus. If it's bothersome, it can be improved, but it's not an overnight fix. And a lot of it takes your dedication to the management plan. But if you follow the, the recommendations, uh, the tinnitus should definitely improve from them from where it is today. And Dr. Libman. And my biggest message is just love your ears. <laughs> you know, we, we often don't pay enough attention to our ears compared to our vision. Um, and I, I see people that come in for a hearing test who haven't had a hearing test since they were in elementary school, for example. There's many things you can do to protect this sense that is just so lovely. Um, and, and oftentimes you're preventing tinnitus onset in the process as well. Yes, well, thank you both so very much. Um, we got to just about all the questions. We, we <laughs> you were really both uh, veterans in, in handling it. Um, and thank you for your expertise and for your caring, Dr. Libman, Dr. Scaglione, and to you, the audience, the hundreds of you who joined us tonight on a Thursday evening. 
uh, to participate and to become more educated about the subject. Um, if you'd like to continue the conversation with our experts, we invite you to schedule an appointment by calling 305. I think we're going to put the screen up so that people can, can see it. Uh, two, it'll, it'll be up. There it is. Okay. 305-243-3564 or by visiting umiamihealth.org slash tinnitus or tinnitus. And if you have a smartphone, I'm going to re-engage you to tune in, use your camera feature and point it at that QR code on your screen and you'll be directed to our appointment request form. It's that easy tonight. You can take action tonight and set up an appointment with one of the expert audiologists from whom you heard tonight um, and get your, your treatment plan started. We certainly hope you enjoyed tonight's U Miami Health Talk. We encourage you to complete the survey at the end of this talk to provide us with feedback, tell us if you enjoyed it, and even give us other topics that would be of interest to you. Good night, Dr. Libman. Good night, Dr. Scaglione. Good night to all of you in the audience. It's been my pleasure to be your messenger tonight. Have a great night, everyone. Stay well.